Well, Brett Siva, welcome back on the podcast. Thanks so much, friend. Thank you. You sent me, you sent me the, the you sent me the invite, and usually I'm like really picky about podcasts. But as soon as it came through, I was like, I can't respond fast enough. I can't wait to get back there. So it feels like a a family reunion. I'm so excited to be home. It does. It's it's just weird because this time I'm actually interviewing you because I had you on to interview me, and it's like a little little reverse. I know that was fun. That was, that was like one of those moments where I was like, th- that was like humbling where you were like, would you interview me? I was like, this is a big responsibility. So thank you for that. Like, I didn't take that lightly, but it's fun to have the tables turn. This is much easier. Right. Like maybe we don't have to, you know, share our life story on this one. Maybe we talk about what the audience can value and benefit from. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's get in really where I wanted to get your wisdom and your genius is talking about client experience. What I've kind of been harping on a lot over the last few months is that clients come back for results and experience. And I know there's been a lot of talk of recession and pandemic and rebuilding businesses, or I've moved and I have to start over. And so much of what clients you can, and and see if you resonate with this clients, if you don't get the results exactly how they want it, there's some leeway and forgiveness. If the experience is stellar, but if the experience is not stellar, no matter how good the results are, you will struggle to retain the client. Does that something that resonates with you? 110%. Oh, okay. So that's what we're going to dive in today is like the experience really is, yes, you can't have no results and great experience. You can't have great results and no experience is the combination. But I do think if I had to put more emphasis on one, probably would be the experience. So tell me from your perspective, what makes for a make or break experience or a great client experience? That's such a big question to unpack, but I also think it is the number one question that all of us, like you, me, whoever's listening to the show needs to be thinking about right now. I think experience is going to win 2023, 2024, potentially for the next four to five years. I think we're coming out of this time where what won was, um, how fancy you looked on social media, like your influence won over the experience in the last kind of iteration of the beauty industry. Thank goodness we don't have to compete in that rat race anymore because I think that the consumer today is so much less worried about like how fancy you look on the outside and way more interested in like what I call perceived value or the value of the services, the nurturing, the relationship they get while they're a part of your business. Like consumers want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. And for us, that comes down to experience in every sense of the word. Yeah. I mean, I I remember just even when the priority was having an aesthetic feed or like your feed was all curated and color coordinated and how with reels and short form content, it's so not that it's the messy and like the relatable and the funny, but it doesn't have to look good visually on a feed for it to be valuable. Remember how exhausting it was when we would sit there and we're like, but how does the grid look? Like, how did these 16 photos look together? It was a nightmare, but that was the game. How easy it was because you just did the checkerboard pattern. You're like, cool, I just need to do a blue post today. And here's just like my flower photo. Like, I'm good. Every third post is a quote. So I'm set. Like, (laughs) you're right. You're right. Because we didn't have to be authentic. Like, so long as you looked fancy, like you, you could wear a mask and play the part and get by. And the irony is we all complained about it. Like, oh, social media is so hard. It's so contrived, the aesthetic. And now a lot of us are like, wait, I'd like to go back to when I didn't have to be vulnerable and just post the quotes. It's so funny. Like now we have, we have the authenticity and it's like time to, time to rise to the occasion. It's a challenge for people. What do you mean? I have to show my face on social media now. Like it's a requirement. No, no, no. Let's go back to like stock photos. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. So tell me about, let's start with the, the marketing component of the experience. Cause I think that when we're talking about social media, it's that initial relationship and connection building, which is really where the client experience starts long before they've ever paid you anything. So talk to me about how you would advise, or even just the, the mindset that you look at your marketing as a part of that client experience. I just love you. And I love that we're <laughs> starting there because how many times, like you've probably heard it too. I've heard people say the phrase like, well, once they come in to see me, they'll fall in love. Like once they get here, they'll understand why I'm different. Friend, they're not coming. Like if if they can't understand the experience long before they get to your, your suite, your space, whatever, honey, they're not coming. Like you'll never get there. And clients today are actually looking for that visual representation of the experience 
on what I call the marketing funnel. So that's everything that exists, your digital footprint. Let's keep it that way. Like your website, your social media, your Google reviews, your Yelp reviews, whatever it is you like to use to be your digital footprint that's branding your business. If experience isn't plastered all over that and all that you're doing is saying, I do good work, come on down to exactly what you said at the start of this show, that's just not enough anymore. Too many people just do good work and offer a terrible guest experience. And I think as we head into this next season of, I keep calling it the R word, like recession, it's not that people are going to want to spend money, less money. People just want to get their money's worth. Yeah. And that to them is that guest experience. So to, to your question, if every third or fourth photo on your Instagram grid, if, if on your website, you don't have pictures of what a guest experience looks like, if you're not describing that and then highlighting the things that you offer that are exceptional, you're already losing the battle. Like your social, everything that you have digitally should be like a full picture of what it would be like to be a part of your business. And I think that's really where a lot of our industry is missing the mark. A hundred percent. And even, and, and the way that I teach the marketing is you want your clients in your, or your potential clients in your marketing to be the girl in that photo. They like to be the hero, not about you as the service provider and what the business can do. They don't care about you until the, you, they know you can care about them. And so we have to make our marketing about them and their experience, their transformation, their results. And that is the piece I feel like is missing across the beauty industry. It's like, cool, look at the balayage I can do, or look at this full set I can do. And it's, we can't even get to the results until we, they know we understand the pain points of why they're even seeking that service in the first place. So what does that look like in actuality? Because I, I think the default thought about experience is visually what they see when they walk in, like, you know, the fancy chandelier or the comfortable treatment table or kind of how do you define experience? I love that you asked that. And I'm I'm looking at my phone right now. I'm pulling up somebody. I'm literally going to have to send this woman a gift because I've, I've shared her Instagram profile or, or maybe we're just going to be friends now. I don't know. I shared her Instagram profile like three times in the last couple of weeks, because when you look at her Instagram, you very clearly see what it is like to be a client in her chair. Mm -hmm. So obviously I coach hairstylists. So this example is of a stylist on Instagram. She is sand.stone studio. Her name is Taylor Layton and she describes herself as a hairstylist and an energy healer. So when you, when you look, one of the first videos I see at the time of this recording, it's this video of how she cleanses her salon space at the start of a day. So she opens her suite. She does a sage burn. She like feather sages the entire suite. Then my she said, oh, she's so my kind of girl. So then she, she sets up, um, she sets up like candles. She does essential oil. She puts them in her towel warmer. She shows these little experiential details. Now, could she just on her grid show pictures of crystals, pictures of essential oils, um, say I'm a Reiki healer or whatever. She could just say that, but when she shows it and when I feel like I know exactly what it would be like to sit in her chair before I've even had the chance to, that's when you are showcasing experience in a really deep way. And, and as, as you scroll her grid, there's, there's so much more, there's details about like the different amenities that she has. There's videos of her working on clients to what you were saying. The client is the star of the show in those videos. And as I'm scrolling, I can see who sits in her chair and instantly opt myself in or opt myself out. Hey. But it, it, the way that she shows up, all of her clients are smiling. The energy that she brings to the space I can tell in 2.5 seconds looking at her Instagram exactly what the guest experience will look like. And I think that 99% of our industry cannot make that claim. Yeah. Well, and even when we're talking about results, so it's, it's, I mean, cause I, I just pulled her up too. And I can see that, um, you know, it's got a lot of photos of her, but like, to your point, you don't have to show yourself in that it's show the lens of what the client would be seeing coming into this space, because that's a virtual experience that you're creating for them. And also let's, let's be real who this, who Taylor is competing against is probably just showing the results alone. And so she's trying to draw people in on the results, except uh, not the experience per se. So when you have a client who is messaging you and DMing you, how much do you charge? And you are being compared price to price. 
if it's an apples to apples comparison of this result versus this result, what th what you're saying to Sand Stone Studio is that she is showing the experience and the value long before price is ever brought on the table. So even if she's more expensive than you know Joe Schmo down the street that can do a very similar result to her, she's already, like you said, increased that perceived value. So when the price point may be higher than what the client had expected, there's already this perceived value of, oh, well, she does energy work as well. And that will be a very niche target market as opposed to anybody who's just price shopping. 100%. And let's say, let's say she's not as skilled. Maybe she's brand new. Like, I don't know her. I, I don't know her business in depth. Maybe she's only been doing hair for a year. And maybe her, the way she does hair is just so-so. But for me, there's a lot of value in and I know not, not everybody buys into this, but walking into a space where the energy has been cleansed, where it's built for positivity. Like to me, I am willing to pay a little bit more for that. Now, does, can the result be terrible? No, but I can see she doesn't deliver a terrible result and the atmosphere, the experience is going to be aligned with what I value and what feels worth it to me. Yeah. And she will also repel those that like think it's woo woo and ick and really just want the result. And so it's it's this nice blend of her being unique in her space so that this whole saturated market of like, there's just so many competitors, I have to be cheap prices. It's like, no, there's a way to be the most expensive or the highest value for the money that you charge, as opposed to, well, it's we're just comparing results and I can get I can do a full set and they can do a full set. And here we go. Completely. Can I tell can I tell a story that jumped up for me as you were talking? You you spoke, you didn't even answer. I'm gonna tell my story. I asked for permission and then I'm just gonna take the lead. Go for it. It's your show. Go. Okay, great. So you you mentioned a moment ago, like understanding the problems and speaking to how you solve them. My daughter, I have a 19-year-old daughter, so she is very Gen Z and is all about getting and sustaining her lash extensions and she first started getting extensions I guess it's almost a year ago during her senior prom that's when she started them and she found this lash studio that was um, very highly rated on social media very highly rated in online reviews I looked at it I was like this checks all the boxes it looked clean fancy I'll use the word fancy definitely like you'd expect to pay a higher rate great she went there the first time great experience she went there the second time great experience the third time she had made an appointment and it was like, she showed up, I'm trying to remember the details. She showed up and the person she had booked with wasn't who was taking her and she was caught off guard. No one had told her it had switched. She sat down in this person's chair, already feeling nervous, wasn't happy with the, with the result. I'll be honest. I thought they looked fine, but I think that because she'd been thrown a curveball, she wasn't expecting nothing was going to be right at that point because she, she already felt and picking apart a different experience. Completely. Even fine. Yeah. Completely. So she's like, okay, whatever. Everybody's entitled to a mistake. So she has her next fill. She calls, she books with her person that she likes to see. The day before her appointment, she gets a text that's like, oh, so and so can't do it at that time. You've been moved to 1 p.m. And she's a full time student. And she was like, I can't do that. That doesn't work for me. They're like, okay, well, you got to come in in the following week. Forget it. So now her experience is terrible. This is a very highly rated, they charge top dollar. They're moving her all over the place. It doesn't matter how fancy she looks. The experience is terrible. Wouldn't you know, she now sees the legality of this is questionable. This is my disclaimer. She now sees a lash artist who does lashes out of her own garage, which a lot of us would look at that and be like, that's a terrible guest experience. That isn't marketable. The legality is questionable, but I'm using this as the extreme example my daughter now prefers this garage lash artist. If you look at her social media, all she talks about is problems and solutions. I will never run late for you. I will never run long. My pricing will always be competitive. So she sells herself on the way that she overcomes the challenges that a lot of clients may face if working with a different lash company. And to the way she's marketed herself, I say like, well done. The way she's working, obviously questionable, but the fact that somebody would go from a top tier lash salon to somebody's garage because of predictability, timeliness, consistency, like, consistency great communication, like that is what counts. Yeah, and not I, we get so many um, people who are concerned about the franchise models, right? that oh my gosh how can i compete like they they charge so low for a full set and i'm like there is something that is unique about you that a 
business that has multiple team members cannot compete with. You are the only artist they will see always. And so you will get that result consistently. That relationship will be built. So there is something that is unique about each and every different business model. And for me, when I was a solo artist, I actually loved the people. My target audience was those that went to the franchise, pay or paid the lower price, didn't get the results, had their natural lashes trashed. And here I am coming in like a hero, even though I charged almost double being like, I'm going to prioritize your natural lash health. I'm going to get you a beautiful customized result. And my appointments are going to start on time, end on time and be the most like best lash nap you've ever heard. And so mm. I targeted people who had already been and did the cheap thing and didn't get the result of the experience they wanted. And then they came seeking me. So even in our, in our, um, in the lash world, they have something called new, cl or uh, what do they call it? Foreign touch-ups. And I hate that word, guys. Don't use foreign. It sounds like it came from another country. It's just like another lash artist did lashes. And then they go, they didn't like the results or experience. So they find somebody else. But so many of our artists turn them away because somebody else started the, the job. And it's like, that was my target audience. So I found a way to do a new client touch-up meaning they didn't have to pay the full set price a second time. They actively sought me out for the pain points that I solved. And so I found a win-win where it was higher price than my normal fill, but not quite a full set. It was a longer appointment. It may have required a removal, fine, but I found the win in that because otherwise I was turning away what became 90% of my loyal clients because they were seeking me out for a specific pain point. And I marketed to that pain point. And you built trust as you resolved it. So even as you were talking about like how you positioned yourself as a lash artist, y'all have to remember, like, as I come on the show, Tara is the expert and I'm the dummy when it comes to lashes. So as you were talking about the things you innately did, because you felt they were like the best way to serve your clientele, there's a few things that you mentioned where I was like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. <laughs> like even when in that little sentence, but that's what people should talk about on social. Like when you said preserving your natural lash, that isn't something that you mentioned one time in a caption. That's something that you post about every two weeks. And it's because people don't realize like people, it has been normalized. Like if, and maybe this is normal. You tell me if you get lash extensions, you'll lose about 50% of your natural. Like that is the, the storyline that I hear all the time. Maybe that's true. But I think that if lash artists were saying like, debunking myths or talking about what is not normal or what they do to preserve X, Y, or Z, that to me would be highly valuable. The other thing that you mentioned that I think was really important is you said, you know, honoring that one-to-one -one experience, people only value that if you make it good enough. Like the way you described it made it good enough. If Sarah comes in, you're like, sorry, girl, it's a little hot in here. I just finished one. Give me one second to clean up. I don't feel like you value me. I feel like I'm just a cog in your machine. Yeah. And, and so it is, we, this is not the season where we can take guest loyalty for granted. Mm -hmm. This is the season where we really pour back into them and see Sarah as a whole human reconnect and be like, Sarah, we've been working together for nine months. How has this experience been going for you? What are some ways that I can serve you more deeply? And those are the questions we should be asking. So I talked this um, to uh, Caitlin of Salonish. I went and did a whole client experience thing with them. Yes, I know. Thank you for that referral. I met her at Thrivers Society Live. Um, I, lo I love her and I'm personally offended that I wasn't there just to hang out with you all, but that's awesome. fine. Next time we'll make that happen. Caitlin, if you're listening, let's make that happen. Yes. Uh, one thing that kind of like blew their minds, but is something, and this is a free gift to y'all. Ask the client every single time, but especially that first client, what would make for a wow experience today? And don't guess, let them tell you, do you want a quiet appointment? Do you want to sleep? Do you want to talk? Do you want your own podcast in your ears? Like don't make, you don't have to guess at this stuff. They can tell you. Now, the first time it happens, sometimes people are so caught off guard because it's not common that they don't know what they want. If you continue the habit of asking it, they will come up with something or whatever happened last time that they didn't like, they'll be like, actually, I'd really like for you to be quiet. When I go get my hair done, I don't want to spend two hours having a conversation like I want to work while I'm getting my hair done. I want to be productive. So you hush up back there. Love you. Do your job. But that to me, having a conversation all the time with my hairstylist feels really draining and taxing. And so I am just looking for the results. But if she can allow me peace to focus on what I want to focus on or listen to a podcast, that to me increases the experience without her having to do a thing. 100%. I agree. And imagine you walk into your hair salon, maybe your stylist does this, but she's like, listen, I got to charge. If you need to ch charge in, like you can plug in here. And she knows like, hi, Tara, it's your quiet time. We're still doing the same thing. We're all good. Say something if you need something. Otherwise, I'm going to let you do you. That yeah. to you is worth its weight in gold, but that that wouldn't have even 
come up had you not had the conversation. I was coaching a stylist recently and she was like, uh, what I do really well is um, deeply connect with my clients and we get into these deep conversations. And I was like, okay, great. Do you talk about that on social? And she said, no, but they, they, it starts to build as they come in. I said, you need to talk about that externally because no offense, if being a part of your business means we need to have deep conversations, I'm not coming. And it's not because you're not talented. It's just not for me. And I think talking about those experiential nuances is the best thing for building the most profitable business, no matter what specialty you're in, because to what you were saying, it helps people to select their way in or select their way out. It can't just be about the end result, but like literally the little tiny nuances of how you do what you do. Okay. So let's dive in because I know the objection that's going to come up when, when they hear select their way out is the scarcity. Mm right? Yeah. Of, well, I need money. So whoever can come into the business, like, I don't want to turn anybody away. Can you share how you approach that mindset of like, I would never turn somebody away, or I would never want to put something out there in my marketing that might have somebody go not for me. I totally get it. Um, that is a very rational fear. And I understand. Um, and that actually was correct, probably up until like 2012 or something like that. It was actually better to be a service provider who could like serve everybody. Um, what do they call it? Personality flex, like that you could just morph yourself into whatever every guest needed you to be. What has changed is the consumer's mindset. So consumers today want to see a specialist, not a generalist. Mm. You can't. You can't change that. That's just simply how they're wired. So when you position yourself as like, all are welcome, I can do everybody, I can do everything. You have now lost like 70% of the opportunity to build business because it's a very specific type of client who just wants whoever can get the job done. And let me tell you, the people who are like, you know what, I'll see whoever so long as they can get the job done. Those are the people who demand refunds that will never send you a referral. They show up late, they no show. That kind of clientele is not ever what you want. Those are the headaches, the clients that are worth building on, that you'll retain, that you'll actually build a, uh, a scalable business off of yeah. are the ones who do want a specialist. Yeah. And I think to your point, the people, especially listening, because, you know, we, we only draw in people who are really interested in learning to build a business. Those that you're seeing out there that are trying to be PC and cater to everyone, let them have it. Yeah. When you are intentionally trying to build a business, when we're talking about being able to charge not just a great rate, right, and not compete on price, because if you're going to compete on price, you're going to you're going to head down. You got to be the lowest. You got to be the cheapest or free. That's not what you can build a scalable business model off of. So if we're looking at where is the highest value of both exchange and results and experience and the money that comes in from the client, having that specialty or that target or that niche market is really what this is talking about that can afford that or who values that customization or that connection piece. That's why we talk about having people opt in to wanting what you have to offer and the results. Because again, that experience piece, you can get great results, but if they don't vibe with you or they don't like your energy healing, you're not going to retain them for very long until somebody else comes along that they fit better with. So it's not long-term. You're not getting clients in and getting the max customer lifetime value out of that person because they're kind of just not there for the reasons that you have built your brand off of. Totally agreed. And and I'll speak to myself as like a lash client. I personally, I'm not 75, but I'm not a spring chicken anymore. So <laughs> sometimes when I look at like how lash artists or makeup artists um, promote themselves, mm -hmm. it's on all these like 20 year old faces. And while I love that, like, trust me, I continue fighting to look like a 20 year old. I love it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm much closer to 40 than I am to 20. And I think if I saw more lash artists showing women who look like me, like working moms, I don't need, I don't know what y'all call it, but I don't need it to look like there's a caterpillar on my eye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, like you're going to fly away by your lashes. Yeah, I'm good off that. Like, I think it's great and it looks killer on some people, no judgment, no shade. But if you just showed me a subtle enhancement, on somebody who looked more like me, you'd win me over and then some, and I'd send everybody to you. Yeah. But I think there's this fear of sh like showing up as you are. Who do you like? Who do you like working with? Who do you like having conversations with? Who do you vibe with? Who tips you the best? I talk about money. I have no issue with that. Who doesn't try to bargain shop with you? Like that is who you should be marketing for. Who has discretionary income? The 20 year old? Hello. Yeah. Hello. 
it's obvious to me. And it, I don't know that I've ever seen a lash artist who targets like women in their late forties to early sixties. And I think it's like, I'll, a I'll show you some of my students. Cause we talk about that heavily. Cause I talk about, I don't like, so mega volume is like the thickest, most strip lashy kind of look. And it, is something that we charge the highest amount for traditionally in our, our industry because of the skill set. And it takes almost three hours or more to do that. So it's a big time commitment. I do not even like volume on me, which is like two steps down from that. I like classic because I just want to enhance what I got. Cause here's the thing. I'm a busy mom. And most of the time I don't wear makeup. And so if I have anything that like big, heavy lashes means I have to put makeup on every single day every single day. And that's like an extra time waste as opposed to cool. I can just throw on some moisturizer and not look inappropriate at the school drop-off line. And that is again, a target niche, right? Cause it looks ridiculous. If you don't have your brows on, but you have these big thick lashes, like it just, it's, it's, it's a Picasso painting here. <laughs> First of all, I'm dying because as you said that there's like three moms I thought of when I was like, oh, I know that lady. I know that lady who's looking a little out there at the school yes. pickup line. I know her, but I think even to what you were just saying, like explaining like lash looks, what is possible? Those are the things I, as a consumer, like I look at lash artists or skin, oh, the amount of times I want to reach out to like an esthetician and be like, please let me help you with your Instagram. Like the, the thing, the things that they're posting, I'm like, this is not what I need to know. Like, I don't feel like you are educating me, talking to me, relating to me. Um, here, here's a horrifying story. So um, when my daughter decided to take her lashes off, it was over the summer, we were about to go on vacation and she couldn't sustain them. She ordered, I'm sorry, don't be upset. She ordered yeah. stuff off. She ordered stuff off Amazon to do it herself. Mm -hmm. And so she was like, no worries. I'm just going to lay on the kitchen counter. I should have videoed this because the visual <laughs> would have been amazing. I'm going to lay on the vision counter, uh, the kitchen counter. She had like half rounds under her eyes and then she petitioned me to do it. And I was like, girl, this is a terrible exactly. idea. I would have I helped you out. Just watch it. <laughs> Like I'm sweating thinking about it. It was traumatizing. So I have this Q-tip and I'm like trying to put the stuff on and her eyeballs are burning. I think like if, if, if you were educating people like on the importance of removal, like safety, maintenance, like I think there's even an educational piece that gets forgotten sometimes. And oh. that is, ex and that's the experiential. Like when we're talking about experience between visits, I want to see the lash artist who's talking about that. I want to see the Mac makeup artist who's talking about skincare. Like I want to see the person who wants to help me every step of the way. That to me is so sexy. And I feel like that's a missing piece of the message. Totally. Because I think what ends up happening when we get into the industry is like, we're again, focused on those results. And so we have knowledge bias that, oh, I know this. So my audience should obviously know this. Like the more simple you can break down, even just what happens a lot with um, lash clients is we have tweezers, right? And so our tweezers will sometimes touch and clients think, oh my God, are you going to cut my lashes? Like, no, it's just my tweezers touching, but their eyes are closed the whole time. They have no idea the experience of what's going on around them. And it makes, some will speak up and go, are you going to cut my lashes? Others just panic. Right. Internally. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh my God, she's going to, she's cutting my lashes. Cause there are some places that will cut your lashes to make them all the same so that it's easier to get the extensions on. There's less like isolating you have to do. Um, but yeah, there's so much, a lack of knowledge, even just in different curls, like even just how are they applied one-to-one -one versus one-to-many? What's the difference between we, we have this term called hybrid in our industry. Most people equate hybrid to saving gas on a car. They have no idea what it means in the context of, of an eyelash service fills, right? The, if you could equate what is commonly known for nails of getting your nails filled in, you get the full set first and then you just get fills. It's the same thing for lashes, but so many clients think that the full set is the price that they're paying and the time commitment they have every single time. When in reality, the, the budgetary concerns that they need to have is for the ongoing fills, which is about half the price usually and far less time. But most people, when they're like, how much do you charge? They're like, here's my full set price. And it's a two to three hour appointment. And you're gonna have to lay there the whole time. The clients are like, well, no, I'm just going to go order those strip lashes online and like lay on my kitchen counter and glue them on. As opposed to it's a one hour appointment every two to three weeks and it costs $65. And, you know, yes, there is a one time first service of a full set. Like when you go get nails, we can talk about that. But it is so much harder to give that perceived value when you're giving the highest, most expensive and most timely service right off the bat. Yeah, clients are going to ghost you in that. A hundred percent. And one of the, one of the things I coach my thrivers to is the idea of... Um, 
a one-year journey, like committing to a one-year journey. And listen, if somebody is, you know, a lash client or a skincare, oh gosh, I feel like a skincare client has to commit to at least one year with an esthetician, to be honest. Like if we're yeah. really going to get somewhere with your skin, it's going to take, so we need to go through all the seasons. Like we really need to see what's up. But even for a lash artist to, to be able to say like, I think you'll get the best experience if we choose to have a 90 day journey together, it's going to look like the initial install. You're going to have X amount of fills overall. It's going to cost about this much. What do you think about that? That's out of my budget. Okay. No worries. So let's look at what is within your budget and let's make a plan based on that. Like that's that experience stuff that we're missing. I think, I think what you were saying earlier, we're like, we're so focused on those high ticket, the initial, I want somebody who can pay top dollar. And then whatever happens after that just kind of is what it is. It's like that focus on just casting a wide net and getting as many people as possible to take the bait, that mindset is not going to get us where we want to go moving forward as the industry shifts. Yeah. That customer lifetime value really is where the focus should be. Cause it's not just getting them in the door because our full sets and I, you know, whatever people say about discounts to me, discounting is a strategy and your full set is where you have the opportunity to discount on the strat on, on getting them in the door and lim eliminating maybe an objection they might have because the fills are our bread and butter. And so if I look at, you know, even if I take a $50 discount on a full set, but that client comes back for the next six months, every two weeks at $60, I will take that $50 discount all day long, but I'm working on that client retention piece, which is that experience part. So one thing we haven't touched on that I really want you to share as we kind of kind of wrap up this conversation is that in between guest experience, because I haven't heard anybody but you talking about that, but I think there's so much to it. So lay it on us. What does that even mean? I want to throw a fact away and then I'm going to dive into it. And when I share this fact, people call it fear mongering and I don't care because it's not fear. <laughs> it's fact. It doesn't matter to me. It's okay for me. Um, our industry is set to be in the top three growing industries of all the industries in the United States over the next 10 years. The beauty and personal services sector, you can look this up on the Bureau of Labor and Statistics website. Um, the, the personal services sector is in the top three of all growing careers. Think engineers, doctors, lawyers, teachers, everybody wants what we got. The reason I say my my daughter, my daughter joined the industry. She joined um, in uh, August of 2022, largest, largest beauty school class to ever go through. It's the same wow. program I went through. The class beneath her, the class that just started has 11% more students. So you have to know the impact is massive. And I keep saying winter is coming. Like <laughs> make no... I'm sorry. If you're a Game of Thrones fan, you know what I'm talking about. Like make no exception. The competition to get new guests is going to be painfully stiff. And people make the, the comment of like, yeah, but Gen Z doesn't have the drive or yeah, but we know a lot of people in the industry don't make it. That's fine. The percentage of people who make it, if the volume enter entering is higher, will still be higher. Yeah. So to your point, the retention and the guest experience between visits is going to make you or break you in the next five years. When we say experience between visits, we should have learned this when the pandemic hit. Our clients, like how many of you feel like your clients expected you to check in on them? Like we were going through a hard time, at least in the, in the like hair space, our clients were offended that we didn't check in on them, like that we were waiting for them to reach out to us or that we were just simply sending mass updates. Our clients really felt like when they sat in our chair, they were special. And then as soon as we weren't taking their money that we didn't give a damn, uh, which is not true. It's not true. It doesn't right. matter what the truth is. The perception is the truth. Yeah. And that to me, I was like, whoa, light bulb. And I also knew that wasn't going to change. So even though we are the person providing the service, our clients want to feel like you give a damn about them every single week. They're not here. Now, can we sustain that? No. However, I say you should be not everybody likes this. I'm just going to throw a bunch of ideas out there. Following your clients on social media, liking and commenting their photos when their lashes look good, when they're having a nice skin day, say something, send a DM. Hey, I saw, I saw this, you know, new look made me think of you quick. Um, if you did somebody's lashes, makeup, whatever for uh, their sister's wedding, they were going to for their own wedding. Do you send a card expected to land one week after their wedding saying, I know you must've been the most beautiful bride, such an honor to be a part of your day. Here's how you'll come back in for your next fill, you know, cheers to many years ahead or whatever, yeah. just showing that you care beyond the transaction is going to be so critical moving forward. Um, and part of the way we can do that at scale is the way you show up on social. Are you educating? Are you elevating? Are you offering 
information that can help to elevate the experience when somebody is not with you. And I think it is finding that balance of how to do it at scale and then how to do it one-to-one. That's really going to count and it's really going to matter. Yeah. My head immediately goes to like, if you're concerned about your bandwidth to be able to do that, raise your prices. Hello. Exactly right. Right. Like you need less clients at a higher price point to make the same amount of money as a lower price point and more clients. So if you're wanting to play that game and you want to provide that experience, a really stellar experience, raise your prices so you don't have to have back to back clients where all of a sudden you've got 60 clients a week and there's no way you could possibly remember even somebody's birthday is coming up, even though they plugged it into your booking software. Right. If you can increase the amount that your clients pay for service, you have more impact. You can have more impact without sacrificing income. I totally agree. And, and if you're, if you're so booked out that you don't have time to do those, those little personal touch touches, I totally agree with you. You need what we call the margin for magic. Like you're already losing, you're burning out, you're exhausted. Your clients don't get a piece of your magic and releasing that fear of having that raise. If that raise allows you to serve at your highest, just like Tara said, there's no greater gift you'll give to yourself as the provider or to the clients who see you. I love that. And then all those cheap clients can go to the beauty school graduates that are coming. And they'll be, hap- they'll be happy to have them. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh. Okay, Britt, let's let's have have some one-liners and taglines here. Um, so based on your perspective of a client experience, what is like a key takeaway that you want everybody walking away from this episode when they go to reevaluate or look at their client experience? What should they have in mind? I would say, put yourself in the client's shoes. Imagine if you were considering getting the services that you offer done. I would look at your own social. I would look at your own website. I would look at your booking experience. I would look at what happens in the time between when I book my appointment to when I come in to see you, what happens there and what doesn't happen there. What would you like to have happen there? What would you like to see as a client? Think about when they walk in. Imagine the person being nervous as all get out. Imagine it is somebody who's been traumatized by somebody who offers what you offer. How would you show them that they can trust you, that you value them, that you're here to listen? Are you doing all of those things? And then once they leave, what are you doing to show that you value them. You want to continue the relationship that you're here, you support and you care. If there's anything missing in any of those steps along the way, I invite you to just be curious and and not put limitations like Tara said about, I don't have time or I don't have money. Strip those things away for a minute and just be curious about what could be possible. Yeah. What's one thing that you can do this month to improve the guest experience, you know? Yeah. I think for me, what was really helpful for me, especially as I was just starting out was being curious about me as a consumer and a customer and my experience and businesses that were not related to the beauty industry at all. How do I feel when I walk into my favorite restaurant? How do I feel in my nail shop when they know my name and they already hand me the basket knowing generally what colors I have uh, or that I like, you know, when I go to my favorite Starbucks, why is it I pick that one over like the 70 other ones within a 10 mile radius? Think about your own buying behaviors and your own perceived value as a consumer. Because once you kind of understand yourself as a customer and a consumer, it's much easier to start to look at your business through the lens of a customer and consumer, which I think most people miss out on. They're so immersed in like my roles as a business owner, all the things I have to do and inventory and ordering and financials and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, when you prioritize a stellar customer experience, all of that other stuff starts to fall in line because it helps support that. Completely. Yeah. Completely. Amazing. All right, Britt, where can they find you? Where can they learn more about Britt Siva and all the magic that is Britt? <laughs> you can hang out with me on Instagram at Britt Siva. That's where you'll find me the most frequently. I also have a podcast called The Thriving Stylist Podcast, and my website is thrivingstylist.com. She's amazing. Oh my God. She has been an inspiration and an aspirational figure for me for years. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Until next time, have a good one. Thank you, friend.